not even one year deep into investing, are you yet? No, April will be uh, my one year, man. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And you're already at 6000 yeah. Now, how much of that came from capital growth and how much of it is from just contributions? Yeah, so I'm actually got my portfolio pulled up here. So the actual um, – the actual portfolio value is six thousand four hundred and nine dollars and ninety five cents uh, on the year. I am up uh, nine point sixty two percent. The end of the year of last year before this year rolled in, I was right at nine point nine nine percent. So I have five hundred and sixty two dollars and fifty five cents in uh, you know capital appreciation. Oh wow! So, okay, so you're, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. So what do you? What would that average a month then that you're contributing? Just to give people an idea. Uh, well, I will give you what my goal is for 2020, and then because last year I just kind of it varied. So I average, I probably deposit anywhere from three to five hundred, maybe yeah. three to six hundred, you know, on average, you know, every month of last last year. And then this year the goal was five hundred a month. Yeah, that's pretty much like the recommended levels, right? Because I still try and keep that minimum of around four to five hundred a month, no matter what. Yeah. So it's nice when you can get to that range where you're popping a thousand away, because that's when you really feel it. But man, <laughs> that's a hard thing to continue unless you're uh, unless yeah. you're like some of those other hardcore uh, earners out there that are you know banking in some serious dollars. <laughs> what stocks are you buying? How many positions are you holding right now, as of now? So as of now, in my Robinhood portfolio, I have 26 holdings. Uh, all of them are dividend payers. In my Robinhood portfolio, it's just a complete dividend portfolio. Um, three of those are ETFs, and then the other three are all dividend holdings. So a total of 26. And then I do have my stash portfolio as well that I have a total of 10 holdings. It just reached a little over 500 bucks, so very small. Uh, but uh, it's starting to grow, and it's a mixture of both. So I have dividend as well as uh, growth companies in that one as well. Uh, what kind so, of growth companies are you holding? Uh, so I have, um, I mean, I guess you can call Apple, but Apple's more of a value in growth, but I have Facebook, Tesla, and I just added Aurora Cannabis as well uh, to the stash portfolio oh, with, the, oh, no. with, the ma with the major dip. Uh, so I, I mean, we could talk about that later if you want, but I mean, I used to hold it in my Robinhood portfolio when it was like $8 a share and I sold out of it. Yeah, we're going to... Uh, we're going to have to come back to the MJ sector, bro. We're definitely going to have to come back because yeah. uh, it's it's every time I bring it up in the latest live streams, people start losing their minds about it, and Aurora is a pretty uh -oh. good hold. But before we get to, yeah. too deep down that rabbit hole, uh, I want to ask you, what uh, what are your biggest dividend holdings? I mean, Apple is an incredible holding right now considering it's been on fire, but what are you holding for mainly high dividend yields? Right, and I really wouldn't count as Apple because I don't own a full share. So, I mean, if we're just going to talk about the Robin Hood, I'm pretty evenly based out of everything. But my biggest allocation would be realty income right now, ticker symbol oh, o. oh, the O realty, yeah, man. I've been oh, there, yeah. keeping an eye on that one for sure. Everyone's talking about it right now because it's starting to – I wouldn't say it's coming into value, but it's definitely uh, – let's take a look real quick because uh, I analyze this one constantly, and I debate on whether it's one that I want to add considering uh, right. we, we can see uh, there's just a little bit of a dip they're trying to show everybody only a recent yeah. dip of what we're down maybe 10 percent see the thing that yeah. worries me about this stock is the fact that it does bigger fluctuations than this on like a bi-monthly basis so i'm hoping to see it drop almost as much as 20 percent but lately in the past the biggest dips we've been getting are around those 10 percents uh but I'm, which is true uh so i mean i don't know if it's worth taking a, a bit of a chunk out of it it just depends too because well. I compare this to some smaller cap REITs, and the problem is, is the uh, everybody knows it's a quality company. The PE is absolutely absurd at 58 for a REIT. <laughs> um, so that's the problem I usually have with it that keeps me off from buying it. I know it does insanely well. People have done great with it. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, Morning, Morningstar has it valued at like 65. You know what I mean? So technically, if you look at it, it's pretty overvalued right now a little yeah. bit. You know, so... Um, I'm, I did just add quite a few shares in because I'm kind of, uh, I guess it's ADD when it comes to uneven shares. You know, I like to have even shares if I can, <laughs> yeah. you know, in certain positions, you know. So I have a total of 10, you know, 10 shares of realty income right now. They're paying about, paying me about $2 and some change every month, which is decent. Uh, but I, yeah. I don't know, man. I'm having a hard time looking at these things at all-time well, highs. Um, considering... I got to read for you, man. I got to read for you. I actually just added one share. I'm going to be adding some more here. Uh, towards the end of this uh, week coming up when I do my next deposit. Yep. Have you heard of I IPR, Innovative Industrial Properties? I IPR stock. Let's take a quick peek. Uh, man, dude, it, do I've some heard. research, man. It is uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, the P very uh, new. Uh, P is still pretty high on it. It's uh, fairly large cap. It's very new. 
It's very, uh, very new. It's just been on the uh, market a, a couple of years. Uh, yeah. Has grown the dividend that first year because uh, oh. they kind of basically they basically own like all the uh, properties where the growers are going to grow like the uh, cannabis and things like that. I so guess, they're not. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go so down. It's a very interesting. <laughs> we'll go down that topic. We might as well. So that's obviously a wreath then that's involved in some kind of, you know, cultivation. But um, yeah, I guess yeah. we'll go down that road. What are your thoughts on Aurora Cannabis? Man, you know, I um, now granted, I think um, it can drop lower, obviously, but I think potentially, who who really knows? But I think we are. Uh, I think we've kind of seen the bottom. I actually bought 10 shares on my stash portfolio. My average cost was 194, so I kind of got in really low there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. So, I mean, I got it pretty low there. And, and honestly, uh, if you know anything, well, I know you do, but if anyone else knows about the cannabis industry, you know Aurora Cannabis has the uh, cheapest per gram. Uh, I think they're the most uh, diversified as well uh, in the cannabis industry. Um, and also some of the uh, bigger people in the industry just recently purchased some more shares as well when the company kind of hit that bottom. So it kind of gives a indication as in, that the, the, the insiders are saying, hey, this is potentially the bottom. This is how far the stock is going to go. Now, granted, yes, it can go lower. The entire industry is down 70 to 80 percent. Uh, but I think this is a, a great long time hold to really potentially triple you know, your money. It's definitely a long term hold, though, for sure. So the government's really loosening up uh, the, the regulatory uh, the problems here, man. So the prices have dropped substantially. And then on top of that, they're issuing a thousand licenses, I think, just in Ontario alone. Don't quote me on that. But we're going to start seeing these things open up like, uh, you know, cupcake shops left, right and center. Tim, <laughs> they're going to be like coffee shops, bro. They're just going to be everywhere soon. Um, so it'll be neat to see how that expands upon the, uh, the income. And then we'll get to see who finally starts winning uh, at the game. And I'm also waiting on. I got my eye on uh, the ETF MJ as well. Uh, that's the only other. That's the only other. Uh, you know, cannabis thing I'm gonna add. I have Aurora Cannabis, and then once I see a decent pullback on MJ, I'm going to add some in there. That way, I can just be you know diverse along the whole you know sector. I mean, industry. Yeah, so. I I think the ETF has been really fascinating to watch because these guys that ran this ETF did it very intelligently. Uh, because the most thing that confuses the hell out of people with this one is the fact that right now it's paying out a 9.44% dividend Man, yield. Bang, right? And the only reason they're <laughs> able to do that is because they just take out short options against their stock because obviously they were expecting some volatility. So the way to protect shareholders and mitigate that downside risk was to simply uh, yeah, take out short interest against it and for as long as the stocks keep dropping in the beginning. But honestly, it still comes back to the same point for me, man. I think you're getting in at a good price point here, but anybody that was getting stuck in that terrible point you know, a year ago where there's seen nothing but downside. Yeah. I still think the best positions you could have bought are the ones uh, that I've been recommending here, like MO or like Constellation Brands. So Constellation Brands pretty much owns, what, 50% of Canopy at this point, and yeah. their chart looks absolutely nothing like Canopy's, but you could still get that oh. full exposure, right? You own, do you own any MO? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, so I you, do. You have the same exposure, and at least you're getting the dividend yield out of it, right? Because that's, yeah. that's how I'm playing the waiting game. I figure MO, if Cron actually takes off at some point or at least starts doing half-decent sales, I mean, that alone could, you know, jump up MO another 20 or 30% on the bottom line. Absolutely. Um, so I'd rather take that, that mitigated risk for now. But we need to see how these work out, man. I think I think it's going to be an interesting year for that sector. Uh, so we'll see if they can start pulling it off. Uh, what else is going on out there? Nobody cares about Bitcoin anymore. Everyone's nah. moved on from Bitcoin, I guess. I truly never understood it 100%. That's why I never really invested in it. So, um, I I can grasp it. I'm not like an expert on it, but I've been in the world long enough, and I know a lot of people that were investing in it. I've been to meetings about it. Unfortunately, the meetings I went to were all Ponzi related, similar to uh, BitConnect. Um, <laughs> yeah, so for it, sure. It really turned me off from there on in, uh, just because. And I don't know. I honestly think my prediction my prediction for Bitcoin is burnout, um, only because it's an asset that. Um, that I can't, nobody cares. <laughs> They're competing with Visa still, man. I think the underlying sure. problems with it haven't changed. And as much as people love it, the problem is, is if you can't get your grandma interested, like in the, the MJ sector, which can still be really hot, even when it's down, uh, same with all the sure. volatile companies, right? Cause people get them, people get Tesla, people get Apple. No, right. like, you, like you said, most people don't get Bitcoin and they've just been, slowly on the burn. So I think they're going to find their niche in the market, but I don't think it's going to be nearly as big as people want it to be. Even though, because right. you don't hear governments talking about it anymore. Uh, Facebook's trying with the Libra, but it's just the, the news is burnt out. 
because uh, it was just a hype pump and dump, in my opinion. Um, yeah. I could be wrong. Don't get me. I, so someone's going to come back to this video in a year and be like, or a couple of years, and Bitcoin's going to be at like 20K again or something, and I'm going to be getting reamed out I for told it. you so. <laughs> Still get that once in a blue moon. I am going to be purchasing more Tesla shares probably in the next uh, trading day or two. I'm just waiting for some money to transfer over because I sold off yeah. some positions. But I'm, I'm really going really to. High. I'm gonna high price. Stir the pot here, man. It's a high price for sure, but I'm still in the same mindset of I, I just want to be buying it below $500. I didn't really care what the price point was so long as it's below 500 or that $70 billion market cap. Um, sure. in, the, in the macro anyways, I, I think in the short term it's still overvalued for what it has, but I'm just playing it on the hype game of waiting to see if self-driving is as nearly as good as they say it's going to be. Uh, yeah. I keep saying this a lot because I don't think it matters as much about um, – selling cars and doing that aspect of it as it is just proving that self-driving is possible because every car manufacturer including uber lyft google they're all competing and they all say the same thing that self-driving somewhere between two to five years away elon musk keeps advocating that we're there pretty much now and the full system will be ready before the end of 2020 so i mean it's it's how much is that bullshit and how much can i actually believe what the guy is saying because the day that they announce look we've done it we can prove that it works and we know it works. Forget what regulatory issues come into play. It's just proving that possibility, I guarantee, will skyrocket the stock at least another 20 to 50% if that news is even yeah. possible. And, I mean, we're Definitely. starting to feel it, but it's not there yet, man. The whole car driving out of the parking lot, it's a little yep. janky. It's not really, you know, <laughs> it's not really. But it's the start. It's the start, though, you know. So, yeah, like you said, it's, it's the start. So, and, and, honestly, that's why I started. That's why I do like fractional shares. I know you're not a big fan of it, uh, but, <laughs> but that's why I like it because, like, when you have companies that are extremely overvalued at that time, you can slowly start to build into them. And then if they do have a significant pullback, you can add more in at that time. To you, you know what I mean? So, it, but I, I understand. I think it depends on what works for you and yeah. your capital that you have coming in as well. Uh, so yeah, I still uh, remain uh, under the opinion of I, I want to have some skin in the game. Like I'm stuck buying sure. stocks right now that are like my worst performers, but I still like them. So I'm going really against the grain with some of my positions. But but at the same time, I just I don't know what it is, man. I just uh, I, I find myself in this range of just trying to keep. I, I think I'm overexposed based on like I just I'm trying to always gauge out the volatility risk of how old I am versus how much time I have. Uh, because, again, the problem that a lot of us get sucked into is the perspective of, oh, we need to be as safe as possible. You need to be at, like, no more than 5% in each position. But the problem is is that that's something you would say to somebody that's, like, 40 or, you know, in their mid-30s that might have a half-decent buildup of assets or they have a family or whatever. But I'm sitting here in my in my parents' house here with hardly any expense whatsoever, and I don't have – I don't have any debt or anything. I, I owe nobody anything. So, I mean, while I'm in my 20s, why not try and take on the added risk to an extent? So, I'm in my head, I'm constantly trying to figure out how much is too much. But right now, I think I'm averaged at about 10% a position. Is what I've been trying to do is between 5 and 10% because I have about 130000 divided out between 12 positions. Um, so, I mean, I, I like the exposure that way because it's getting me a higher rate of return. Uh, I think my average market returns right now are sitting somewhere between 16 and 20%. Uh, That's awesome. It's, it's doing pretty well, but obviously I'm taking on a lot of added risk. But like I said, it's just trying to figure out, is that added risk too much? Uh, and is it going to hinder me down the road or is it going to keep you know pushing me into all-time highs? Um, I don't know what you what your what kind of strategy are you specifically going down? Like how are you leveraging out your portfolio? Is it fairly even weighted? Yeah, it's fairly even weighted. The only one I have the most in would just be realty income, just because I purchased quite a bit recently. Uh, it's about eleven percent, which is ext but that's not going to stay that way. My next deposit into the portfolio, uh, but it's about eleven percent of the Robinhood portfolio. And everything else is about uh, three to five percent uh, weighted. So, and then I have my ETS that are about five percent a piece. The three of those, because it's kind of like a. Uh, in a sense, if I needed cash that I have sitting there as well, uh, yeah. if I need, to, you know, so I kind of have it sitting sitting that way also. So the, everything else is pretty much even right now from anywhere from like 3 to 5% because everything is like overvalued or a lot higher than my average cost. So I'm not just going to buy into the stock because 
you know, I'm kind of waiting for a dip to buy into some of my bigger positions. For time, you know, this year and in the future, I just want to start adding to those positions because I kind of have what I have. I'm completely diversified pretty much in each sector and everything like that, you know, so now it's just adding to my positions. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting route about going about it because that was one of the big debates that I had to have uh, about a year or two ago with myself because I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to start by fully leveraging positions in the beginning or if I wanted to go down the route of fully diversifying and then building on the positions based on what one was down the most. So if in one year, say like five of those stocks weren't doing too well, I could just continually add into them. But the route that I've gone about it is the only reason I, I, I don't plan on having 12 positions, obviously, in the continuation of the portfolio. My end goal is to try and have somewhere between 20 and 30 positions. But um, the way I've gone about it is I'm trying to focus on individual positions per year. So, for instance, like as many of people that follow my channel know, I, this year was strictly like SIN stock focused because they just seem to be so cheap. So it was like MO, BTI. I bought a bit of GEO Group and Johnson & Johnson is a new one that I've been kind of starting to fully leverage into. But, um, yeah, so what I'm trying to do is every year pick two or three stocks within a sector and then just try and build them all the way out to about a 5 or 10K position and then be done with it forever and then use the income to start re-leveraging it into the next position. I don't know if that was the best route to go about doing what I've done, but it seems to be working okay. Um, but yeah, man, I, I see where you're coming from, because that was like the biggest debate that I had. Um, and I just, I, I've, I'm kind of interested in the, the route that I've taken here, because it's definitely a lot more risky. But I mean, look at the returns though, man, 16 to 20% on average, you know, and, and is that including the dividends as well? That is the combination of dividends and the growth. That's still um, incredible growth though, man. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it depends on when you look at the portfolio too though, right? Because it comes down to how much, year over year, it's it's been pretty good. Mind you, in 2018, we didn't have any rate of return, but it's the years, like this year has been insane. The year before it was pretty absurd. So it's those combination of the years that have done really, really well. Um, but honestly, it's just the fact that uh, you it's the volatility aspect of it because you could come onto my portfolio with what I'm holding a, a month from now. And if we hit another tariff, uh, bad news, like the whole portfolio could drop 20% at whatever time. I mean, like, again, with what we were saying about Tesla, right? Like I held Tesla through the bad times because I was yeah. buying it before the bad times and then it tanked and I had no problem holding on to it. I wish I was buying more then, but I held off buying into the end of the year, uh, which is what I kept saying because I didn't really care about this price point, uh, which I wish I did because I've been loading the boat pretty heavily lately. Um, but yeah, no, it's just that fact that if you came and looked at my portfolio, I can show you. I did a performance update recently where I showed my actual performance chart and you can see yeah. where it took a big dip. It, it, it took a bigger dip than the S&P did just because Tesla dropped a whopping 30 or 40 percent yeah. and then i had geo group which was down another you know 20 or 30 percent and this was before yeah. apple was high flying every other day so i mean at that point in time my portfolio you would have said oh well this is not a good strategy anymore you know 2018 has been dead all these stocks are doing terrible but then you know i just kept hammering it and then boom all of a sudden everything's up a stupid amount again and now we're seeing a better rate of return hold now but uh, but I just want to ask you what your goals were for going into 2020 2021 uh, obviously you said that uh, you're obviously gonna start cost averaging into the positions you own um, but do you have any specific goals are you trying to find any extra sources of income uh, how's the YouTube channel doing for you as an extra source of income uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on some of those uh, questions yeah, so uh, starting with the portfolio, so the goal, uh, it ended a little bit over 6000 so I'm trying to get it to uh, 12000 plus by the end of 2020. Uh, that's depositing, you know, 500 bucks each month, so that's the goal for that. Um, and then for the YouTube channel, not monetized yet. Granted, I have the uh, subscriber base and everything like that. Uh, the community has been awesome supporting me and everything like that, so thanks again, all of you. Uh, but um, I'm about maybe three I have to look at my my exact watch time, but I'm about halfway there, so I'm not I'm close, but not all the way there yet. So I mean, I'm just kind of enjoying the journey, and then once I do get to that monetization, it's just going to skyrocket. Because just looking at my channel growth now, um, and this is with no you know YouTube ads or anything like that, just the average views I get per video is doing quite well. So just imagine once I start to get an extra push from YouTube, things are just going to start to skyrocket. So. I'm just kind of really looking at that value and just enjoying the journey. And outside of the uh, stock portfolio, you're still pretty stable with your job income. Uh, you're pretty yeah. happy with all of that. Uh, so you probably keep continuing the route that you're going down on that aspect. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yep, still 
still working full time. I still make pretty good, pretty good money, which allows me to, you know, invest the way I do, which I'm yep. thankful for that. And, um, you know, just for some goals, I'm obviously once the YouTube channel becomes start making some money that will become an asset. I do have some other things I'm working on as well. I'm still in the process of building my website, which I've kind of been building it for the past two months. So yeah. I haven't been really rushing it because I want it to be uh, put out, you know, right and together properly. So I'm working on that. There's other few things I'm working on as well that we can kind of talk, you know, off air yeah. about. But I, I don't want to reveal just yet until everything is kind of done. If you know what I mean, so uh, I do got some other things I, I I am working on, you know, that will start to bring in some other uh, forms of income. YouTube now, if you got to the point where your yeah. stock income and your YouTube income and whatever else you were doing took off, would you quit your current job? Absolutely, because it will give me the free time to do to do more that I want to. Because granted, we're all kind of off of you know uh, limited time, but. I'm a firm believer as in we all get 24 hours. Now, how we choose to use that is completely up to us. Now, granted, we got families, we got jobs, we some of us have kids, but we all have certain responsibilities. But if we choose, if one person chooses to sleep eight hours, another person chooses to sleep four, that's a choice. You know, I think, it, you know, I'm just, you know, being real. And I think sometimes we have to look at that reality, you know, to get ahead. Because, I mean, we all have 24 hours in a day. We have we have different, you know, responsibilities. You know, I get that. You know, but how we choose to use our free time, you know, is strictly up to us. It's not always how much time you have. It's what you do in that time. I totally agree. Uh, finding time to leverage, though, is also a challenging aspect, uh, which I think I briefly <laughs> was discussing with you at the beginning of this about uh, how things yeah. get in the way of you trying to make quality content. Um, because the time, man, even with the time I have, yeah. I find I don't have enough time. It's it's so annoying, and I'm one of those people that has to sleep, bro. How many hours a night are you sleeping right now? Honestly, man, anywhere from about five to five to six on the on the most seven hours, and I'm good. But I've never been a person that need like a ton of sleep, like eight hours. Bare, I probably never see eight hours. Really, I wish. Man. Like, I, I wish. Nah, like maybe five to five to seven, but on average six hours, and I'm good. I've learned something about myself over the last few years that I've really taken to heart, which is if I don't get at least eight to nine hours of sleep, I'm pretty much going to be useless. Uh, because I found with when I work for myself, and considering I've been working for myself for the last decade, uh, only recently though, and I think it's just because I'm getting older, but my my stamina and my mental fatigue. Uh, the health, I'm, I'm sure I got to start working out a little bit more now that winter's here, but I'm always finding that I can get way more done in three hours if I've had proper sleep and like proper motivation building up to it than I can if I sleep for four hours and try and get a bunch of tasks done over the whole day. Because I find that you get that brain fog, you get distracted, you find the tasks start taking twice as long, and like my optimization goes way down. I remember there was a story that I briefly read about, uh, but it, it depends on the person too, right? Because some people can get away with four hours of sleep and they're fine. I am definitely not one of those people. But uh, there was a story about Mike, is it Microsoft or what company was it that started doing four day work weeks? And they found that they were getting, they were way more optimized working four days a week than five days a week. Uh, because when they came into work, obviously they were more refreshed, more revitalized. I think that's the hard balance to find because uh, I try and work as much as possible and I pretty much work until I get bored. Uh, then I go relax until relaxing becomes annoying and then I go back to work. Yeah. Uh, man, you want to know what's so funny about that, man? So, right, when me and my wife, we moved into our new place that we're in now. We moved in the beginning of uh, last year, of January. And I got a PS4 and I played it once when we first moved in. All right. And never played it since then. So it's been a full year since I played my PS4. And I was, you know, big time gamer, man. Love the game. Still love it to this day. I just haven't played it. I just rather utilize my time with something else. And um, so yesterday I'm waiting on my MacBook to do a, a big time update. So I'm like, all right, I guess I can go play my game for a second. This is the first time the year I've kind of been without being able to use my laptop. So I go, I go hop on my uh, PS4, go play UFC. Literally play two fights, get right back on my laptop. And it's just like, man, it's just incredible how the mindset and my perspective has changed on, on what I choose to consume my time with. Like, it wasn't even fun anymore almost. You know, like I, I chose to hop on the game. Then it was like, you know what, let me get back on my laptop and find some other. You know, it was just kind of weird, man. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat, bro. I uh I go to my fr I try and go out when I'm relaxing. I don't like staying at home. I'd rather there's luckily I'm 
I'm a very sociable person. Like people just seem to really, you know, be friendly toward me. So it's kind of nice, especially my job, because I'm friends with like the mailman, and I'll go see the mailman. Uh, and the guy's awesome, bro. You become friends with your mailman. The guy sends me messages every time I have a package before it's here, and then he'll text me five minutes before he shows up. Uh, nice. I love the guy, and I just started being nice to him like a year ago, and all of a sudden, like I'll go over and see him once in a while, and I'll play games with my friends. But I get the same uh, burnout, bro. I uh, every time I stop working. And then I start playing games. I start relaxing. I get about an hour into it, and I'm like, yeah. "Shit, shit! I gotta, I got shit to do." <laughs> I'm like, I'm falling behind. Uh, yeah, so, man. And then I get pissed off when I see other people that, uh, especially people like, because I, I work so much with Matt now, and I'll, I'll be doing something where I'll be relaxing or slacking off, and then he'll be doing a live stream or he'll be jumping on with like uh, all the other guys on YouTube, and then I'll get so miserable because yeah. I'm like, shit, I should have been there. I like, I should have been at home. I should have been engaged in this stuff. Instead, I'm out and I can't do anything. Uh, hey, I know the feeling, man. <laughs> it's nice. It's a good mindset, though, man. It's definitely a good mindset because it's the mind. It's the non-broke mindset. Of uh, for sure, because my friends, man, they don't they don't got any investments, they don't got any money. A lot of them got debt, and it's all because they still would rather go home and play video games than go to work. So I think it's kind of funny to see that that perspective of it on my end, just because my I literally have two lives, man. The friends I hang out with from high school are aren't the best people to be hanging out with on a regular basis. I still like to try and keep connected, but they're definitely not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, which is, it's a shame. I've tried to help them, but they're really happy with where they're at. They love going home, playing video games after work till like midnight. And I don't yeah. mind stopping in once in a while. Now your social life, how much is that getting affected by uh, what you're trying to do? Um, I will say it's been effective, but on the contrary, I'm kind of a introvert as well. So, I mean, I'm very, uh, to myself, if you know if that makes sense, I don't leave the house that much. I don't really go out and party, or you know that's kind of not my cup of tea. So I mean, I'm pretty. Um, it's just kind of me. So I mean, I do, I do go out with like friends and stuff like that. Not like to clubs or parties, but like to dinner and you know things, something like that, things like that. But nothing. Um, so really uh, crazy for the how, most part. I'm how, working on my business yeah how frugal are you uh when you do go out when you have an outing for yourself uh what are you doing yeah. any hobbies what uh what are you doing on the aspect of saving money that way uh well the the main hobby that i do next if it's not you know youtube or stock market is martial arts you know so that is a monthly membership that i do that i do pay but granted there's money coming out but i look at it as an investment as well so i don't really you know, per se, look at the money as in it's hurting me or as in a uh, liability. I look yeah. at it as an asset, you know, because I'm constantly investing back into myself. It's good, too, just to get moving around because every time I go to, say, the rec center and I'll go swimming or something like that, like, obviously, you're paying for it. But at the same time, I always just look at it as an investment in my health just to get my body moving around. Uh, but you don't uh, – you, you and your girlfriend don't go out for much dinner dates. Uh, do you guys – We do, and when we do, I mean, I try to – we don't do much because we are we're both kind of on the financial minimalist. So when we do go out, I mean, we kind of spend you know what we want you know to enjoy the time being yeah. you know. But because we don't go out a, a ton, so when we do, we just you know eat what we want. I think the only thing we'll splurge on, luckily because we don't really drink, um, is yeah. um, what is it called? Bubble tea. I don't know if you are familiar with Never bubble heard tea. Of it. No, really. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, dude. Uh, it luck, sounds uh, appetizing. Luck, luck, so. <laughs> Literally, if we're going to go out, it's usually for a few set of things because we know what's cheap and we know what we like. Uh, but, like, the only thing I know that we, like, severely splurge on will be bubble tea. And essentially what bubble tea is, it's like this uh, it's this Chinese drink. Luckily, uh, where I live, we have the most diverse culture of food because we have everything from, like, Pakistani food, Indian, uh, Vietnamese. Um, so we get everything. But this is becoming super popular in uh, in Toronto, there's pretty much one of these on every single block. Uh, I'm just trying to find uh, an image of it to show you. So essentially, there there's tapioca balls in like this slush that you can get. You can get that as just tea as well. Like you can get regular like milk tea, but uh, and they also put lychee in it. Um, so it's like this drink that you almost have to eat. So when you're drinking it, you get this big straw and you're just taking in these these balls of tapioca that are like sweetened. Okay. Um, it, they're expensive though, bro. They're like five bucks a drink, five or six bucks. 
they're they're crazy expensive but uh they, literally we went out for it i think two days ago we went and bought some uh but usually we only go there if there's discounts if they're doing some special but once in a blue moon we do splurge and we'll do something like that but luckily uh she's on the same page because i know that's a big problem for most people that i've talked to you about in the past as well it's dating uh the dating life can be real challenging uh, when it comes to trying to be uh, financially frugal uh, but at this point in time, I think we'll finish it off here uh, for the parts that I'm going to break down. And then what we're going to do, I guess, is we're going to head on over to the live stream, uh, if you're still yeah. down for that. Uh, yeah. And we'll see if we can start bringing you over more subs, too. So uh, part of the course.